Okay. So, we are going to do a monologue intensive about what makes for an effective monologue, why you should have an effective monologue, how to not have one, <laughs> what makes for an unaffected monologue. I'm going to cut to the chase right up front and just cover this. There are only really a few acceptable and terrible reasons why actors do not have some catalog of monologues with them at any given point in time. One is the easiest. I didn't know. I had no idea. Nobody ever told me. I didn't know it was important. Nobody gave me the insight on it. Okay. So if you don't know and you're hearing this now, now you do know. The reasons why monologues are so important. Now, the reason I say a cachet of them is because twofold here. One side of monologue preparation is you're only going to get better by going in that direction. If you're continually looking for monologues, keeping an eye out for something that resonates with you, you're starting to learn more about story and character. Huge. How is a story told? Different ways that stories are told. Knowing when you feel like you're in the telling of a story. What type of characters are, are communicating these monologues? And who are you relating to when you read them? You're going to grow by doing that. I've been reading monologues for decades. It's, it's not anything I think of as work. It's, you just do it. It's just part of who it is that we are. It should be a passion for you. If you don't have a monologue and you don't want to have a monologue, you might want to reconsider why you're an artist, why you're an actor in the first place, uh, because it, it just, it just, it's, it's too much sense. By the time I'm done explaining all this to you, you'll see that it just makes no sense. By you reading these monologues and going through the selection process, not only are you going to learn what I've just mentioned to you, but you're going to start gathering different uh, types of uh, characters for you. Maybe one character on one side you find you have something in there that you, you're, you're familiar with and it fits really nice in a monologue piece. Like if you're a young girl and you're yelling at your father because of the struggles of being a teenager. I mean, fantastic. If you're a young girl who's a teenager, then that's a piece that you know shouldn't be too overly difficult for you. But then you start looking around and realize, oh, wow, I didn't really know that I could do this. And as you're reading monologues and you, you, know, you throw in a country accent and you go, oh, wow, Western, look at this. Hey, I got a cowboy in me. What do you know? And, and, and you can start discovering all kinds of wonderful things about yourself if you're not judging and putting a limitation on you. Once you go to work on a monologue, it's everything. So let me encapsulate it like this. When you go to see a very good movie, a, a movie that's well done, it, it's going to be, uh, let's just put it this way, look for the monologues, because there will be monologues in there, or at least there should be, especially a killer monologue for the leading character. Because at a certain point during the storytelling, the character is going to be working up either on trying to handle the conflict or coming out of the out of the resolve of the conflict, wherever they are in the three-act structure, giving this monologue. And the camera is going to push in. The score is going to come up. It's going to be a complete one-on-one -on -one character through the actor and the audience connection. Now, if you're watching this in the big screen, and in, in, in the average size of a close-up on a big screen is about 70 feet by 50 feet. That's a huge face. You see everything. You see pulsations, twitches. You see thoughts and eyes. You see it all. And so by the mere nature of you wanting to be an actor and all the reasons you want to act, you have to be able to handle the ECU, extreme close-up, monologue moment when it's all about you nothing else no one else you have to hold the entire frame 
Sounds easy, right? Sure. You might be thinking, oh, yeah, no big deal. Yeah, well, I don't find it's that easy. I've been coaching actors for a long time. Uh, it's not done all that successfully all that often. You have to work up to it. The monologue prepares you for this because it's you, one, mono, talking. That's it. There's no distractions in the monologue except what you're bringing to the table. So your ability to analyze script, build character, tell the story and answer the questions and look interesting while you're doing it and carry the information through the duration of the monologue, in my opinion, shouldn't be longer than a minute and a half tops. I find a minute to a minute and a half monologue is, is ample time. If you talk to industry professionals that are going through thumbnails, they barely give you five seconds. If you're, if you're interesting, ah, they'll give you maybe 10 or 15. So these like two and three minute monologues, I mean, I don't, I, for training and for practice in, 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 in theatrical venues and for different purposes, sure. But for our industry, film and television, a ah, minute and a half is just fine. Minute is fine. And it's a nice size piece to be able to really sink your teeth in and not to be overwhelmed by as well. Because by the time I'm done explaining this to you, you're going to see the amount of work it takes to really effectively have a monologue where it needs to be. Which brings me to the next reason why monologues, the actors don't necessarily have monologues, and that's the work. They just don't want to do the work. And I look at it this way, if you don't want to do the work, then why are you here? What are you doing? If you're a golfer and you really enjoy golf, chances are you're going to find yourself from time to time at a driving range, at a putting green. You're going to be doing things to keep working on your stroke. Uh, it's not complicated. Dancers will go into, in, into a, 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 a workout and spend the first 45 minutes just doing the stretches to prepare for the rest of the time the remaining half hour, 45 minutes to, to dance in a class. You, people that are really, truly hobbyists, that are enthusiasts, that are into different sports, are going to take their time where they can get it, whether it's free time or they're carving the time, to find a place to work out what it is they're impassioned by. So for somebody to call themselves an actor and to not be doing this, to me, in my humble uh, professional opinion, makes zero sense to me whatsoever. You see, it doesn't cost anything to work on a monologue outside of your effort and your energies. You don't have to really pay these days. If you have a cell phone, it's, you've got monologues in your back pocket from everywhere. There are sites out there like crazy. They're on our website. You just go to student resources and it'll, it'll say scenes and scripts, I believe, something to that effect. And then there's all kind of links to endless, endless, endless monologues and scripts and stories and teleplays. It, it's, it's free. You just get it and you just keep reading and reading and reading until you start finding pieces. And then when you start finding pieces, you go to work on them. Now, at a certain point, you should hire a coach. You should hire a professional to come in and start dialing you in, but that's a little premature right now. So if you really want to do it right, sure, there's a little expense in it, but come on. For training purposes, you could work out dozens and dozens of monologues and never lay out a penny and become a better actor on your own time. You can work a monologue while you're waiting for anything. Now, personally, when I was an actor, well, they still bother me. I'm not really keen on, on red lights. Who the heck likes stopping? I like going. You get going, you got to stop. Ah, okay. But, you know, you're at a red light and some red lights. You ever get that red light that you know internally? Your internal clock is going, wait a second, this thing should have turned green by now. Mm -hmm. And it didn't. And you're going, what? And you actually realize that it skipped. Sometimes it skips and it doesn't let you in. It, like, doubles the other traffic and it skips you on a traffic. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I don't know. And I don't like that stuff. It, it would drive me crazy. When I was working as an actor, I would continually have a monologue folded up in my pocket, something that I was working on. And the cool thing is, when you're in traffic and you're in a traffic jam, it's not going anywhere. CHP's doing the whoop-de-woo, holding everybody off, or you're at that crazy red light, you're working on your monologue. 
and you're just reading it over, working it over, working it out. Trust me, when the light turns, the, the person behind you will give you a friendly reminder. <laughs> <laughs> and you just go. And, and you're in an audition. If you're an active uh, uh, actor and you're out there auditioning, you're sitting in the waiting room. My gosh, I can remember sitting in the waiting room for an hour, an hour and a half, in some cases two hours. Now, union, they got to pay you for that, but still, you're sitting around. What are you doing? Looking at everybody else or, or playing with your phone and doing social media and stupid stuff that doesn't do anything? Or you could be working on a monologue. Oh, well, that's the difference between professionals and amateurs. Pros are going to submerge themselves into what they're doing so they can become a specialist. And a specialist is somebody that does just that. They specialize in one thing. And an actor's one thing is their ability to tell stories. And the monologue does not require a scene partner. It requires you and doing your work. So, I say get off your blessed assurances and uh, let's get down the road with learning how to make monologues effective. So you don't only, only just have them, but you know how to execute them and to get them to scream, to sing, to soar. So that it's like, wow, that's pretty stinking good. As opposed to, when's this thing going to be over? You know, that type of deal. So we're going to go ahead and cover these things now that I've got your attention on the importance of having a monologue and why you should. And well, several, I say minimum three. Just, you don't have one, what are you doing with your time? That's the, and I mean performance level, ready to go. Bam. Three, you should have a dramatic, a comedic, and then what I call something that's special or unique towards your own personal skills or ability. Something that, that gets you to speak uh, really well, that personalizes you. If you do accents, maybe bring in a piece that lends itself to accents or something that's highly character. You want to be careful with anything that, has to, that, that is dependent on anything outside of your performance, like props and wardrobe pieces because you'll never know where you'll be asked to do a monologue and you don't need to be carrying around a bag of tricks. It should just be your ability to go into the character and when you know it well enough, boom, what do you need? Comedic? Dramatic? Just let me know what you need. Okay? And then you're, you're, you're ready to deliver. And if you're into Shakespeare, go for it. I personally am not uh, uh, very uh, keen and up there on Shakespearean pieces. I like working more contemporary myself. Uh, there are specialists out there that would do uh, far more justice than I would. And if you're into the shape, although I can coach it and I do coach it and I have coached it, um, I would go to a specialist if you want to do Shakespeare. But I also wouldn't perform Shakespeare necessarily in front of casting people and industry people that are looking to turn around the next day and, and put actors to work in the breakdowns that they're reading on a regular basis. That's just my opinion. Okay, so do whatever it is you want with the Shakespearean stuff and period pieces such as those because for me, the monologue should fit you like a glove. So I'm going to give you a couple of bullet points on where you got to go with monologue performances. <clears throat> Here you go. First thing is the fit. You need to find the monologue that fits you and monologues that fit you fantastically well. Now, if the monologue doesn't fit great at the onset, no worries. You get it tailored and you work with it and you personalize it. Now, some people are really good at writing and they can make these adjustments. If not, you need to work with a coach or an industry pro that's good at this, a professional writer, that knows how to edit and customize a piece for you to make it work specifically for you. So let's say you find a piece that just speaks to you and you're in your 20s. And somewhere in the monologue, there's a line that says teenager or 30s or 40s or whatever. I mean, you, if the monologue still works for you, you just edit around that and you make it work. If there are certain things that aren't quite you, you make them work. You, you, you can take a monologue and edit it and customize it so that you're able to speak with it uh, with as much power, ownership, honesty, and believability as possible. And whatever it takes to get you to connect to that truth and that honesty. Fit is huge. That's why you need to read a lot of monologues, a lot of screenplays and teleplays and plays to be able to find 
just that right one, that one that you can work yourself into. And even if you're stretching a little bit, say within your wheelhouse, great, but just know what it is it's going to take. So like, for example, if the monologue requires an accent, but you don't have it, wherever it may be, you've got to study out that accent. Because if you're performing this, uh, there's a real good chance that somebody that knows that region is going to call you on it, and you definitely don't want to get hit with that. So if you are picking something like that, you got to get real good at it. Let's say you're using a cigarette, and, and here's the big deal. If you're not a smoker, <laughs> you need to spend some time learning from real smokers how to hold, manage, handle, lip, smoke a cigarette, because I, I can spot it in a second and it just pulls us out of the scene. It pulls us out of the suspension of disbelief. Your job when you're giving a monologue is to suck us into your world and take us on a journey. That's ultimately what you're looking to do. So, fit is huge. I've seen, I, I, I do some uh, kid coaching periodically and I, I love it when my little teenage girls try to do Queen Elizabeth. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah, that's great for fun and working out, but I mean, you know, come on. You know, it, it's like the, you, you, you want to find pieces that fit you real well. But we go, oh, wow, I totally believe that. I can see them in that right now. I can see them in that movie. I can see them in that show. Boom, there they are. And that's what really what you're looking to, to produce. Okay, so you get the monologue, and now we've got to build the monologue from the bottom up. The issue with most actors, in my opinion, is they want to get a monologue, they want to memorize it, and then they want to go on the ride and have fun. That's short-sighted stuff. That's hacking stuff. That's like you're, you're, you're just doing quick fix things. You're not really into building it. I'm going to show you what you need to do to be able to build yourself a craftsman. A perfectly groomed monologue that is layered and that'll stand strong over time. Just like building a, a good home as opposed to like, <laughs> you know, some just wheel in a trailer and hold it down with straps and wait for the first big wind to come along and see what happens. Good luck. As opposed to a house that has a solid, well-built uh, basement. The geos have been done on it. The engineering and structure is up to code. The framing is right. Everything's been built from the ground up. And then you furnish it after the house is constructed. Now you get to live in a house for a long time under all kind of weather conditions and you're gonna feel good about it. It's no different with a monologue. You hack one, and I know it. Actors call me all the time. It's a Tuesday. Coach, you need a private. I, I've gotta do a monologue for the guessing director on Thursday. You don't wanna be in that situation. That's crazy. You want that monologue ready for that call so you can go, got this, no problem. Would you like comedic, dramatic? One minute, two minutes, 30 seconds, what would you like? Okay, and then you can do it. Just like a singer, a real singer, you know, just to give him a song, let him go. A real dancer, a real musician, just, just it, anybody that's real is going to be ready to go. When you're not, you're, you're him hawing around, well, you know, if I come in, I'll get this excuse, I'll get this excuse, get this excuse, get the and it's like, yeah, okay, great, lovely. So I guess you want to be an actor. You're studying to be an actor, but an actor you therefore are not if you can't deliver a monologue. I mean, it's crazy to me. It just doesn't make any sense. And that's it. Jury's back in on that one. You gotta learn the lines. Track, bass, you've gotta know the lines. The lines can't be being pulled from your head. You can't be getting caught up with the lines. You have to have the lines so ingrained in you, they're circulating through your bloodstream. They're just in the molecules of the blood in your body that come out anywhere. Like if I ask you right now, what's your phone number? You know, blah, 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 blah. I mean, you should be able to, to, to just rip it off without an issue. You know, what's your address? Boom, 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 boom. You know, what's your favorite this, favorite that? I mean, there are things that just come out of us. We're not pulling them from memorization. It's when you shove information in your head and retain it for a short period of time just so you can regurgitate it. That's low-level stuff. You don't want to do that. So you've got to get the lines ingrained in you. Now, that can be ingrained in you over a period of time. But the lines have to be gotten so they're not in the way. Once you have the lines down, you need to articulate those lines and do articulation, voice, speech, and enunciation work 
on each and every letter, consonant, syllable, beat, pause, moan, groan, cough, scream, whatever's in the monologue, you've got to work it out. Now, there's an over-articulation exercise on the ClayBankStudio.com website under Actor Resources on the drop-down, Training Videos, Voice Speech Articulation, Over-Enunciation Exercise. There's all kinds of exercises in there for you to articulate better. Work your entire monologue piece to that. The whole thing. How much of this do I have to do, coach? Well, only the parts that are important. <laughs> it's you and the dialogue. All of it. So we're working this thing again from the ground up. You've got to get the fit, get the lines, and then know thy lines. Have them so we can hear the words, especially when the emotions kick in and you start ripping on certain parts of the piece. We've got to be able to hear what you're saying. We want to know what it is that you're saying. We want to hear the T's and the P's and the B's and the R's. We want to hear the letters and the combinations so that it sounds amazing. So you work the articulation exercise on it. Then you go back through the piece and you're going over the piece and you're going over the piece and all these things are coming together. Take each section of the piece and ask yourself, what does this mean to me? What's the meaning? What's the intent? What's the subtext? What is going on underneath this? You know, honey, I think that we should stay home tonight and have a little chat. That's the line of dialogue. What's the subtext? Baby, we got some stuff we got to work out. Okay, you, 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 why? Because there's something that's bothering me and I need to sit down and I need to talk to my wife about what the issue is. That's what's going on underneath that section there. Okay, I get it. What am I fighting for? I don't want to come across too mean and too attacking. I want there to be love in my voice, but I also need her to understand that this is important without scaring her. Okay, you gotta work on that. There's a, there's a combination in there. So it, it's, it's, I, I, that's my meaning. That's how I want to say that line. So I take time and I work on what is my intent? What is my drive? What is my, what, what is my outcome? What am I looking to accomplish when I say this word? When I say this line? When I say this section of the paragraph? Whatever it is, because intent can fall in one letter. Or it falls in, in a combination of words because that's one concept. So you're, you're looking at what why are you saying what you're saying? And I find so many actors will just get up, memorize lines, get up and start spewing it because the, 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 they were written well. The, the piece was written well. The monologues have been written well. It's like, oh, I want to get behind this. It's like when somebody compliments you on your clothes. You know, it's a nice shirt. Well, cool. I didn't design it or anything. I didn't even buy it. Somebody gave it to me. And like, you know, I mean, if you really get literal in that sense, you know, how, how much did I have to do? Oh, it's my choice to put it on. It was my choice to receive it, or in the case, it's my choice to buy it. So you're complimenting me on my choice, not on the actual material, unless I was a fashion designer and I was coming out and going, oh, yeah, that's a nice one. Great. I've been working hard on this material. <laughs> you, 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 you. What are we doing? What are you saying? Don't just come out and say something because it sounds good. What's your part in it? You getting up underneath that and making a personal one-on-one -on -one connection to why you're saying what you're saying. And you do that through the entire monologue. Now, when you find those significant objects or significant nouns, those things, those people, those places in the piece, they have to be packed with information so that they mean more. So if you say, hey, listen, I'm just going to hop in my car and I'll, I'm going to stop by Mary's and I'll see you there at five. Hey, I'm just going to hop in my car. I'm going to stop by Mary's and I'll see you there at five. So a couple of the significant nouns would be car and Mary. 
All right, so car and marry. Now, you say, oh, well, what's so important about that line? Okay, well, I'm just going to hop in my car. I'm going to shoot by Mary's, and I'll see you there by 5. There's the delivery. Cool, casual. But if you stop and you think about your car, you make decisions. Is your car a big deal in this piece as part of the story? Does the car matter? So let's say the car matters. I'm a car guy, so the car matters. What kind of car is it? Ooh, it's a 1970 SS Chevelle 396, 402 heads. It's got a 456 rear end with a smash gear shifter and the sucker screams. Oh, it's got these beautiful brushed aluminum wheels. And just getting in it, it's like power. Okay, go back, time it. What was that, eight seconds? I just packed the significant noun of my car. I'm going to swing by Mary's. Who's Mary to me? I go, oh, Mary's no big deal. Not a good choice for an actor. Because even if Mary is not a big deal, you've got to make some kind of deal out of it. Otherwise, why did the writer give you the name Mary? Why are you dealing with Mary? Why is Mary coming off the end of your lips? So who is Mary? Mary's a friend of the group. we got a group. There's about 12 of us. And some are married, some are single. Mary's just one of the girls. Don't really think much about Mary, but, you know, I'll swing by her house on the way over. No big deal. I'm just making random choices. Okay, so that's who Mary is. So who's Mary to be? Nice gal. She's cool. Part of the group. Nothing more than that right now. There was a light packing. An overnight trip. Okay. But you see, I've taken the time to capture the objects, the significant nouns, just by doing that. So now when I deliver the line and I say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to hop in my car and uh, swing by Mary's and I'll see you there by five. Something else is happening to me. Because as soon as I said hop in my car, oh, <laughs> I'm in my car. Just for that one little second. Now, the audience doesn't necessarily know what's going on, but something's going on. And it makes me more interesting. I'm going to swing by Mary's. Not a major difference in the read, but something was on it. And sometimes it can be as little as, I don't know about you, but have you ever eaten a piece of chicken and it's just not working for you? So you just put a little salt on just a little bit of salt and say, oh, <laughs> how'd that happen? Sometimes just a little bit is going to make a difference. And if you're taking the time to work through your monologue, you are now, in my opinion, worthy of asking the viewer for your, their time to watch you. Because for me, if you're not doing this work and you're asking me to watch you, how? Because you're in a TV show, because you're auditioning, you're putting on a, 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 a showcase, you're just doing your monologue and say, hey, listen to this, whatever it might be. Or you're in a major feature and it's your turn and it's your monologue and I'm sitting there watching, then you're asking for my attention. You best be doing this work if you're asking for my attention to actually listen to you. If not, you're insulting my intelligence because all you're doing is memorizing lines and thinking you're cute enough that the monologue's going to work. Uh-uh. No. And you should always be working to impress the most difficult to impress person, not the easiest to impress person, if you're serious about becoming very good. Because that's just basically how it works, because our business works in levels from F <laughs> to W <laughs> to H till you start getting to D and then C and then B and A and ultimately A plus. I mean, it's all levels. And for me, there is talent and there's work and there's application of your efforts that determine a lot of this. And you can see when somebody's just doing schlep because most coming about actors, in my opinion, don't put in the energy and the effort. They're either making it by in their personality or their Instagram followers or their, their look or pizzazz or body or charm and their slight ability to be able to wield some language. That's, in my opinion, doing this as long as I have been doing it is the majority. And then you start getting into the people that actually do do the work. So that when they're showing you something, you can go, wow, that's actually really good. Yeah. Similar to, I like making the little analogy. Sometimes some of my, my gal pals that, that are single will need help hanging a, a, a mirror or a picture or 
some kind of work they need done in their place and you know I'll go over there and I say where are your tools and they go into the kitchen and open up a little drawer and there's a screwdriver a hammer and a wrench and there's my toolbox you know that's what I have and then you deal with a professional mechanic and I love it when you see those guys that got like the sixty thousand dollar custom painted snap-on work just tool chests and then inside of these felt lined drawers and all the tools are lined up and they got like 15 tools for each one thing that it's needing to do, you know? And it's just like, that's a specialist. You know, where are you with this? That's the way I look at it. How, what kind of toolkit do you bring when you're asking me or any other industry professional to hire you? What are you showing up to the job with? You know, right? Cool, all right, so. Fit, lines, articulation, meaning, in other words, the, the buzzwords, motivation, intent, what's your drive, what are you fighting for, what you want, what you need, you know, what are you doing, what's happening in the piece. Then we want to go into structuring the piece in a manner and a way that you're able to take us on a three-act journey in whatever period of time that is, even if it's only a minute. You've got to have a beginning, it has to have a highlight, a climax, and it needs to resolve and finish. Boom. Some aspect of that story needs to be told in a very short period of time. Although a lot of one-minute monologues are flat. Nothing happens. No, nothing happens to the character. And they don't, excuse me, actually go anywhere. And it's just boring. It's a flat, boring read. So you, you want to take the audience with you. And you do that through so many different uh, dynamics but it's knowing what you want to do and then l going after whatever it takes for you to be able to do that. You've got to take us on a journey, either your own emotional, personal journey or the st story of, of where situations have taken you. And that needs to be done in a very short period of time. So when you're going back to fit, I, I, the students have been bringing me monologues for years. Coach, what do you think about this one? I go, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't go anywhere. I mean, maybe it worked great in the TV show or in the movie, but that's because you had all these other things supporting it. The monologue needs to stand on its own, and that's another very integral point. When you pick a monologue, the monologue needs to stand on its own. It needs to tell the beginning, middle, and end story on its own for the whole duration that we're watching you. You can't rely on whatever the, if you, let's say you're transcribing it, you're pulling it from a movie or a TV show. You can't rely on what you're seeing that actor do because let's say that monologue comes at the, big, at the, at the beginning of the third act. Well, you've got two full acts that have led everything up to this actor saying this that your new audience does not have. But the audience in the TV show or the movie does have. So, you, you've got to be careful not to just yank something out and do it. It should stand on its own with a beginning, middle, and end. And so when you're going in for the execution, your execution is now being built on a piece that's fitting you well, because you're editing and working with it, especially if you're working with a coach. The lines aren't even an issue, so if they have to be tweaked or adjusted here or there, it's kind of like snip, snip, tuck, tuck, cut, cut, trim, trim. Wherever you need to make some adjustments, it's easy because you're not throwing off the whole piece because you know it. You know the meaning. You know the reason why you're doing what you're doing. You've done your articulation work so we can hear you properly, especially when there's fast riffs and fast banters and a lot of comedic material. You've done the who, what, where work. Now, I didn't cover the where yet in too much detail, but another thing I see actors doing often is coming out and just performing monologues without using their environment, which is a mistake because you're missing out on something that's right there for you that has to be created out of your imagination. You can put yourself in a submarine, in a kitchen, in a bathtub, in the Home Depot, on a mountain. You can put yourself anywhere, but the monologue is taking place somewhere. Where is it taking place? And when you do really get that environment going, you can bring that environment with you everywhere you go every time you perform the monologue. So that's ultra important. Just as it is who is it that you're speaking to? So, keep this in mind. A monologue is a dialogue that we are only hearing one side of. Now, if the filmmakers are cutting the monologue, 
we can see two sides of the monologue because we'll just go to the reaction shots of the person that's being talked to. So now we've got a, we've got a scene, a two-person scene. One person's talking, the other person's responding non-verbally. Now, in the case of you performing it, we're only going to be watching you. You've got to make room for what that other person is doing how that other person is responding, what that other person would be looking like when you say this. What is it that they hear? So you also have to do the work for the other person. You can't just spew it out. Which brings me to the very, very popular question. Where do I look when I do a monologue? Well, you've got choices. One, you can look at the spot on the wall, which I find a lot of people do. To me, it just looks weird. I'm sitting right here. Why are you doing that? I don't get that. Although there are people that do like that. You can speak to an empty chair. You can speak to a person. You don't want to speak to the camera unless you're doing some stylized, weird, wacky, wild thing or something because the camera's peering into a slice of life. Some people talk to the dead in the sense that they're in a casket or they're, they're talking to a body or they're talking to somebody that's unconscious in a hospital. They're speaking to God. In those dynamics where it's a little bit more, okay, there is another person or entity there, although <clears throat> they're not going to respond the same way, say, an alive person would respond. So you need to take that into account as well. So when we watch you, we're getting caught up in this suspension of disbelief. I'm going, wow, I am so there with this person. Why? Because the actor has done all the work. But you see, when the actor doesn't do the work, an educated audience is going to go, well, that's missing. Well, I don't know what's happening there. They might not even know why. It just doesn't work. So he said, what'd you think? Oh, you know, it was okay. It was good, I guess. As opposed to what? <laughs> they slayed that thing. <laughs> they left their soul on the floor. I was there. Hook, line, and sinker. Well done. You know, what kind of response are you going to get? And it has to do with how many of the dots are you filling? How much of the picture are you doing the work on and are you filling the frame? So when it comes to a location, you're just going, okay, I'm in a Home Depot. Okay, well, where? What aisle? What's around you? What's going on? Why are you there? What are you looking at? The more you can fill that picture, the more support system you have as a performer when there's no one else there. So I look at it this way, if it's just me and I've got no help from my fellow scene partners, my fellow characters, the other actors in the scene, it's just on me, I want to bring as much as I possibly can and my imagination work, when it's done right, will convince you. So it's like if I'm in a hot environment and it's like, and I'm really making that connection to this hot environment, and while I'm talking, your body temperature goes up. I'm doing my job. Just like if I'm coming in, it's like, oh, man, I couldn't get the car started. We should have bought that self-timer, that thing that starts the car with the app and stuff. Oh, gosh, it's cold out there today. You know, you can bring people's body temperatures down because you're, you've done the work. Now, I'm just flinging this stuff out. If I were doing a piece that had these things, I would make sure I did the work properly so that it came in and it was very believable. Whatever it might be, do the work of your location when you're doing your execution, okay? Now, I have an interesting um, kind of experiment in front of me right now. Each year we do the one minute monologue contest. We're in year 12, so this is LA's 12th annual one minute monologue contest through claybankstudio.com. And I prep actors for this uh, contest and have for the, obviously the last 11 years, this being year 12. I mean, formally I've done it before, but this is formal in, the, in, in a competition sense. And so intentionally knowing that I'm going to be spending the fall helping actors discover their type, helping them find the right pieces, <clears throat> looking at the pieces that they bring in, Jack, would you mind grabbing that water, the blue water bottle, or Lindsay, the blue water bottle for me? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, bringing them in, customizing them, and helping them get to performance execution level. 
seeing all these things, I have a pretty good idea of knowing what works and what doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And when it comes down to it, the more work that an actor puts into their piece, the more believable it's going to be. So, we have actors that come into the studio and go through the two, two and a half month course of monologue prep and um, we have our hands on them for that period of time to shape, develop them and groom them. But then we have actors that come in from the city that we don't know anything about and they come in and throw their monologue pieces up. And you can see when you're looking at something that's really just so... Ooh, they heard about this contest, they're going to get in front of industry professionals, casting directors, agents and managers, ooh, let me get a monologue together and let me go up there. And you can see it and it's paper thin. The performance is just paper thin, there's nothing there because they really haven't gone to work on it. They either don't know how to, didn't take it serious, were too lazy, didn't do the work, whatever it might be. And now they're going to go up against people that have been just working on it and workshopping it and workshopping it and workshopping. Well, now there's another level of people that I work with, and these are the people that I do privates with one-on-one. -on -one. I get them an hour a week uh, via Skype or in person, depending upon where they are in the world. I've got students in Europe and different parts of the country, and obviously here in Los Angeles. And we will, we will go to work. And session after session after session, we're working on the monologue, building it from the ground up. Now, I have two teenage girls who basically just, you know, they're not as strong-willed as some of the, uh, you know, adults I deal with. They think, oh, I want to be good at this. You're my coach. Teach me what to do. And it's nice because I can really watch what happens when I work with them without getting the kickback from the actor. See, a lot of adult actors will only do so much work until it's not comfortable. You're not saying what they want to hear anymore, and then they just take off or move off, or they won't do the work. They'll find someone else to tell them whatever it is that they want to hear, but they won't get in and do the hard yards whereas my teenagers do do the hard yards. And so right now, I'm, I'm, I'm watching this that's going on right now. Week in and week out, week in and week out, I am taking them through textbook how to build solid monologues, where with the adults, it's not so easy. And I don't, I don't always have them that captive. And right now, taking them from all these levels to the point where they're ready to start executing these performances and turning in their, their finished pieces. It's just like, wow, look at this. This, this cat could barely act. And now look at this performance that they're delivering. This is really impressive. And then I get my actors, especially the ones that are a little cute, that have a personality, that have some charm or whatnot, and they, they're, they're kind of getting by on that, trying to hold them down. To do this kind of work, they slip out, they're just slippery little cats. Slip out, slip out, slip out, slip out, because they're getting a certain amount of results just off of not working. So why do it? A sad answer, because if you've got that going for you, why not just add the work to it? Because if you add the work ethic to all that, now you got a shot of not only getting work, but having a career and possibly being a star. So it comes down to doing the work, and that's why I do these intensives uh, during this time of year to help you understand more about what it's going to take. Um, just had an actor today. One of my actors sent me an email. Warren, you were right there in the room when I opened it up. It said, Coach, I got a bite on representation. They want to see me this week with a monologue. Can you help me? Perfect example. Now, whether or not they are represented and where their career is going to go is hinging on the performance that's going to be done this week in that room with an actor that either has had a monologue worked up, ready to go, waiting to just be polished, Turn the lights on, you know, pull the tent off it and let's go, or we have to build it from the ground up in just a few days. This is real. It's happening right now. So go to work and get yourself some good monologues. I'm just going to give you a couple of uh, little taps here and uh, we'll call this that, okay? 
So again, just to do a review, fit. Fit comes from reading pieces. Read, 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 and become impassioned about reading. And if you write, 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 write. Learn your lines. So you're not having to think about them, and they're not in the way. Some people can learn lines like that. Other people have a little bit more of a challenge. But we're talking a one-minute piece, which is about a paragraph, about that big. Learn the lines. Get them out of the way. Do the voice and articulation work. Understand what you're trying to accomplish with the piece. What is the meaning? What is the intent? What is the purpose? What's the subtext underneath what it is you're doing? Who are you speaking to and develop that relationship? Where is it taking you, either on an internal emotional journey or on an external situation journey? Where's the peace taking place and live out of that peace? Work on your execution. How do you look? What's the blocking? What are you doing when you're saying this piece? So that you're bringing more and more interest and go to work on it and go to work on it and go to work on it and get it and perform it and showcase it. Get a coach to come alongside you and take a look at it. I'll take a look at it. I can look at any monologue anywhere in the world if you have Skype. And let's get it where it needs to be so that you got a shot at showing something that's really good that fits you great. Then you go to work on another one. And then you go to work on another one. Now, you can do several of these at the same time. There's no order to this. If you're a working actor and you're listening to this and you're still staying with me right now, there should be no reason why you are not continually looking for monologues throughout your entire career because even as your, your type changes, uh, your pieces are going to, some of them will stay with you, but others need to be dropped off and you need to move on to different stages of, of the development of your own personal life, which is going to change the things you're going to talk about. Okay? All right, great. Be honest with the piece. Do whatever you need to do to be as honest as you possibly can so that you can take us on the journey. I call it getting us on the bus. When the bus pulls up, I'm going to take a look at it and decide whether I'm getting on. And that has to do with how you're handling yourself and basically the first time you open your mouth. You're either getting me on the bus or you're not getting me on the bus. If you haven't got me on the bus, it's usually because either you're insulting my intelligence, you're not doing a good job, you're not being honest, it's not believable. For whatever reason, I am not going on this journey with you. I don't buy it. There's a lie. I see it's a lie. I see the lie. I'm not getting on the bus. Now, if I don't, and you have me, and you come out, and your posture's awesome, and you go start talking, and I'm like, oh, wow, they're sucking me in. I'm getting on the bus. Now you have to keep me on the bus for the whole ride before I hop out the emergency door. And if you keep me on the bus on the whole ride, and I get back off, I go, wow, man, nicely done. That was awesome. Good job. As opposed to, eh, you know, I guess it was okay. I didn't really know where I was. I didn't know who you were talking to. Why were you looking at that spot on the wall? <laughs> so when it comes back to where it is that you look, you have to make that connection to the person that you're talking to and then put them somewhere. Either put them in the chair, put them standing there, or they become the person who's actually in the room. Whenever possible, use a real person if you can. That's my opinion. Okay? But whatever is going to give you the best opportunity to be as honest and believable as you can. Don't judge yourself when you're doing monologues. Find a piece that you can buy into. Even if it's not you, don't connect your value to you to it. I love playing bad, aggressive pieces. I'm not a bad, aggressive person. I just don't judge it. I don't connect my value to it, and I do whatever it is that's, that's called to play the character correctly and to live out of that situation. So don't judge. Don't judge any aspect of it or you shouldn't be doing the piece. You've got to make strong choices throughout the piece. Um, not really going to get deep into choices. Uh, I think there might be other information on the site that you can look at to find out about choices. I do teach on choices, but it's a whole teaching of its own. Uh, maybe put it in the search bar, just choices, if you, you want to look at any more at claybankstudio.com. Uh, but choices really are about you going, okay, what is going to be interesting here? What's going to be interesting here? 
And the more risky and the more dangerous you can make those choices that actually work within the world of the story. Well, the harder it is, but the more interesting you become. So just don't play it weak. Don't play a victim. Don't, don't, don't buy into the simple. Workshop your monologue to get as much out of it as you possibly can. Now, do you wear an outfit or prop pieces or anything like that? I say you should be able to show up anywhere you are at any point in time and be able to do the monologue. Although there are some good pieces that will require some um, wardrobe, will re require some small props. If that's the case, explore and experiment because sometimes you just putting on a certain wardrobe piece just clicks you right into the character. Boom. I mean, you just get clicked, right? You put that cowboy hat on and then boom, right away you're talking with a southern accent. You know, It's like it does have that magical effect often. Put a cigarette in the hand. Sometimes it takes you to a different place if you know how to wield a cigarette, okay? So um, just see what kind of an effect it has on you and if it's creating something that's very positive and sending you in the direction that you want to be going in. The work should be fun. Well, I talk, talk about doing the work, it, it should be fun. If it's not fun, there's just something not right. Maybe you need to reconsider a few things. You've got to love the language. And you've got to love doing this work and telling these stories. Because then you warrant a place in, in somebody's time and in their eyes and their ears you know, to, to say, okay, yeah, this is an actor. They, they've got a craft down. They're doing this thing. Okay, covered that, and a couple of last notes for you guys. Um, practice it. Practice it, practice it, practice it under all kind of various situations, under all kind of various audiences. Do it to your dog. Do it to your friends. Do it to strangers. Get in a professional setting. Do it in a workshop. Eventually get with a coach. Get with a coach that's going to help you through this. At whatever level of this, I have people coming to me, coach, just help me find a piece. I mean, they just have trouble knowing who they are. And that's like the basic level. Okay, we'll help you with that. Or a coach, I'm having a little trouble with, you know, the who, what, where along the way or whatever. Or right on through the polishing of it. It's going to happen is a coach is going to come alongside you and put an objective perspective on a subjective situation and help you, to help you, you deliver it the way we see it, the way the world's seeing it. And that's priceless information. That's why I have a job, to help people do just that. And that's coaching. I come alongside people on a regular basis and help them with their scenes for movies, for TV shows, for working out, so that you can learn more about you, learn more about how to break down the copy, understand the character more, so that you can get it in you, on you, and of you, so that when you're doing it, you become more and more believable uh, with the stories that you're telling and the characters that you're playing. Now, I have on my uh, blog, claybankstudio.com, CBSI blog is the drop down. It's called the Actors Freeway, and the Actors Freeway gives exercises on working out uh, your character. They're at the bottom of the blog posts, not all of them, but several of them. If you go to the bottom of the actual blog post, of what, if it's talking about character, it'll have an Actors Freeway there, and it's an excerpt from my book. And basically, my book is uh, the Actors Freeway, three things actors can do when they're not on set or in class to continue to develop as an actor. And there are a series of exercises that work on all kinds of different dynamics that you can do on your own without having to pay for it. You just got to buy the book. But these chapters are actually on my blog post, so you can get them sporadically all over out there. Uh, the Actors Freeway, just look at it under monologue execution, under character, and uh, then go ahead and go to work on those Actors Freeways. So we've kicked you off there. All right, now, I feel like I've given you a pretty good rundown of the importance of monologues, why to have them, what they're for, the key uh, building blocks of putting the monologue together effectively, and the uh, do's and don'ts and uh, ups and downs of it. So the rest is really up to you. Uh, if you're watching this video, wherever you're watching it from, and you have any questions, you can certainly contact us and uh, we'll get back to you and help you with that. Uh, if you guys have any questions, we'll address those questions right here, right now, before I sign off over here. 
And also keep an eye out for LA's One Minute Monologue Contest. You can go to our website, which is oneminutemonologue.com, and it has everything and more. You can see past performances, winners, rules, contest, what's involved, links to monologues, YouTube channel filled with one minute monologues, everything monologue is available to you there. Um, I think it's linked up at claybankstudio.com as well as the number one minute monologue.com. And uh, it takes place every fall. So whenever you're watching this, check it out and see what the rules are for each year and what's involved with getting, getting uh, involved in the contest. It's an amazing, fantastic, exhilarating, upbeat experience that just teaches you and develops you and grows you. And also, depending upon the rules of that year, you'll be shown, your monologue will be shown to some of the top industry professionals in Los Angeles, which is really kind of cool. And we have great testimonials that are on the website as well that come out of this as far as careers being developed and people landing representation and working with different filmmakers and things of that nature. So it's really kind of cool. The number one, MinuteMonologue.com. Check it out. Wherever you're seeing this, if there's a like, like us, go ahead and comment, connect with us, uh, reach out to us, anything we can do to help you out. We'll be happy to do that. So I'm Coach Banks. I want to thank you for tuning in and listening, and I uh, hope to see you in the studio.